this particular child also had an uncle. Now, nobody uncles are helpful, and this uncle actually gave help new birth to the little Kwan fellow, little chap was born, and the uncle had helped him out. But then, like a soap opera, the uncle turned villainous. He decided to wait at every street corner and try and run down the poor little quantum. It was crossing the road. And that evil uncle, you may be surprised to hear the name, who hated the quantum phenomena, that evil uncle is Uncle Albert Einstein. This is the story of quantum. It has baffled the most, you know, most scientifically kind of astute mind of the last century. What is told about that, let me tell you. I'm not going to give you the mathematical aspect to it because you'll fall asleep on me. I'm going to give you, if you like, the heart of the matter. What is this quantum telling us? This is what it's telling us. You see, the way physics or the way sciences have developed over the last two thousand years since the time of Democritus is very simple. Try and explain the world around you in terms of substance, lump of matter, and its attributes. Oh, here is clay, you can mold it. Oh, here is fire, don't put your finger in it. Oh, here is water, it flows. Substance and its attributes is the way we explain the world. What a marvelous way, we are so clever with human beings. And we don't stop there. We continue to extrapolate this particular way of trying to understand the world by reducing this to the smallest bit of matter, substance, still substance. Is this a jump or atom? Oh, yes. It was certain mass, certain spin, sort of charge, see, they explain the world. The same phenomena continued extrapolated to the smaller and the smaller and the smallest. Substance and its attributes. See, we can explain the universe. Everything is so sorted out, well sorted out. Things were going fine until the middle of 1920s. And the whole, you know, whole particular process collapsed dramatically. This is how it collapsed. I'm giving you the heart of quantum physics. He says, if you think you can explain this universe in terms of substance, in terms of matter, and its attributes, my friends, you are seriously going to find yourself with difficulties. The father of quantum physics has loudly stuff. He says, if you think we can explain this world in terms of sticks and stones, or smaller portions of sticks and stones, you're talking about elementary particles, then you are going to fail, guaranteed to fail. The underpinning to this reality, this is the conclusion of quantum physics, the Copenhagen interpretation. The underpinning to this reality is guaranteed not to be matter, not material. Matter, says Schrodinger, is an appearance. This is the foundation of empirical science. Because if I tell a scientist, look, I'm trying to explain the universe, <coughs> you say, how do I explain it? You say, I want empirical evidence, Mr. Lakani. I don't want this infinite stuff. Give me empirical evidence. Here is one pebble. Here is another pebble. I can hit them together and I can hear the click, 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 click. This is called empirical license. You know, I can hear it. So clear cut. The answer that comes from quantum physics is, my friend, all you have done is you have collaborated. If you, if you have corroborated, one aspect of appearance with another aspect of appearance, they're making a big hoo ha about it. <laughs> one pebble is validating another pebble. One part of appearance is giving validation to the other part of appearance. Oh, you're so there with you. You're sorted nothing out. So both the pebbles are appearances. Underpinning the pebble is the quantum phenomena. <clears throat> Here lies the most exciting, most nectar like material, not coming out of some Eastern metaphysics. Even though Schrodinger said what we have discovered is very close to meta metaphysics. Mm -hmm. But we are getting, if you like, validation of a deep understanding of nature of reality from science itself. I tell many youngsters, do you think if you, they say, Mr. Lachlan, how do you become spiritual? And of course they try LSD and all that, they've done that already. How do you become spiritual? I say, my boy, if you like art, music, dance, drama, poetry, literature, through the most particular lovely human endeavors, we are becoming one point at a focus and getting a deeper glimpse into the nature of reality. That's when you're getting a thrill, my boy. That is how you become spiritual. Become one point in any field of human endeavor, it will hit, you will hit the jackpot. And it's not only through arts and music and this kind of poetic stuff, it is through modern science, through the integrity of science, by looking deeply at the nature of reality, the fabric of reality, 
We are discovering, underpinning this, is something essentially non-matter that underpins this reality. It is mostly highly unifying, links the whole of this creation. What is that underpinning? What is that underpinning? And that is why the physicists like Richard Feynman would say, chaps, if you can understand what is the underpinning of this reality or what is this quantum phenomena, then you expose that. Then you have not understood it. It will defy any kind of linguistic any kind of expression. It fails because it is something so dramatic. Words fail. Describe what is underpinning to this reality. And in this particular session, what we are beginning to do is we are beginning to try and somehow try and get a handle on this underpinning to reality. And the two ways this handle becomes visible to a modern human being through science is in the life sciences, to the phenomena of consciousness itself. And in the physical sciences, if you like, the central discovery of the most physical of physical features of physics quantum. So let me just touch on it. Just give you a little bit of a kind of light-hearted presentation. When I was talking to one scientist, I said, look, you see, my friend, consciousness is not a brain phenomena. It doesn't spit out of any brain because I checked with Susan Green, which is in Mr. Lakhani. We are trying to find out which slice of the brain produces consciousness, and so far we are failing miserably. You're not true where it is. It seems to be everywhere and nowhere. Oh dear. So it's like that very elusive chat, this consciousness. But those, you know, those, those guys, scientists who said you're so and everything else was so good. That's Mr. Lakhani, grow up. This is just a brain phenomena. Consciousness is just a brain phenomena. Live with it, Mr. Lakhani. Suppose, you know, I inject you with some anesthetic. Your consciousness will go. See, I told you. Or if we don't like you, we come with a hammer and thump you on the head. And we show, show to you out that consciousness is off. You see, I told you this brain pain. Don't make a big hoo ha about it, all this. And you see, I'm good at metaphors, so watch it. I said, my friend, I've got a metaphor to respond to you. Suppose a child walks into this room and discovers that a dimmer switch there. Of course, child, dis children discover things very fast. And he starts playing with the dimmer switch. It goes one way, the light comes on. goes the other way, the light goes off. The little chap will, of course, come to the conclusion that the switch is producing that. You can't stop him from thinking like that. It's just a causal relationship, surely. But we are grown up. We tell the child, my boy, you are, this switch doesn't produce this light. It is a mere conduit, conduit. Transmitter. It just allows consciousness or so electricity to flow through or slows it down. It does not produce it. It is something dramatically, categorically different from matter and its attributes. We understand if we are grown up. This is what Hinduism teaches. It says, my friend, what you thought was a brain phenomena is nothing of the sort. It requires the brain certainly to percolate and make, express itself. But the brain is a mere conduit of something far superior, far deeper, that is percolating through your body and mind complex and appearing through your eyes, as shining out through your eyes as consciousness. This is the underpinning of this world, making its appearance, showing itself through the eyes of living things, most transparently visible. It's maybe through, through the eyes of human beings, but every living thing, even a little single cell, the way you define a living thing and distinguish it from a non-living thing is that it has done the first division. It has divided subject from the object. This is how you define a living thing. It, in a way, immediately partitions itself off into the first category, subject, object. Even a single cell being is aware of its environment, this called cognition. It will move towards light or heat. It's beginning to realize its independence I feel like from the surrounding. This is how you define a living thing. You see, one of the marvelous ways of defining a living thing, biology is also struggle by trying to define a living thing. It's not that easy. So of course, the people from the artificial intelligence will challenge them and say, no, it's just nothing but brain processing. It's just a processing part of the brain. There's nothing more to use. And artificial intelligence can do the same. That's not true. You see, what happens is the way you define a living thing in the Hindu tradition is very interesting. It says the way you define a living thing is that thing that stands up against its environment and does not like to be buffeted by the forces of nature. It tries to, in fact, harness the forces of nature and sit about it. It doesn't like to be pushed about. This is the sign of a living thing. 
is a sign of consciousness. It makes a distinction between subject and object. I see that this is very different from the view of the kind of classical way of looking at a human being, which is the machine. And consciousness is nothing but nothing more than if you like a fuzz in the brain activity. There is much more to consciousness. And this is if you like the underpinning of this reality, seeping through the living form and expressing itself through the eyes of the living beings. This is the definition of consciousness. Now, why is it such an interesting thing? It appears in neuroscience as a central problem, unresolved or the hard problem of neuroscience. But then it doesn't stop there. It makes its appearance in physics in a big way, in a dramatic way. This is why the physicists keep pulling their hair out. Because they don't like consciousness to appear in physics. They don't like spirit. This is the issue of spirit, spirituality appearing in physics. The only spirit that physicists like to believe in is the one that comes in bottles during Christmas period. <laughs> this is stay out. Honey, you keep your conscience out of physics. There's got nothing to do with physics. Quantum mechanics can avoid consciousness and this idea of conscious observer and all that. It doesn't go with it easily. One of the greatest problems in modern in quantum mechanics, it's called the dilemma, is the observer problem. It's called the observer, observer, observer problem or the real collapse problem. This is what happens. He says, really, the world is not an objective reality, but it's a participatory process. The world that you see, as Max said very nicely, we are part of a greater big time, a kind of entity. We are not separating. This separation is if you like our individualization. But really, we are very much part of the greater whole. And to recognize that really, the thing that is in a way, linking all of us is much deeper and not material. The level at which we are linked with each other is much more deeper, not just the material level. And this is the finding of quantum physics. Again, the issue is called quantum entanglement. I'll give you a silly example to give you an example of what this means. If there are two elementary particles linked at one stage in their life, and then they get separated and they move away from each other by a billion light years. There's no more link with them, surely. And according to modern physics and according to the classical physics, the only way they can communicate with each other is at the speed of light. And of course, we like Einstein's speed of light. But now, fun begins. If you squeeze one of these particles, the other particle that was kind of linked with it, was friendly with it a long time ago, which is now a billion light years away, instantaneously goes out. Just give me a simple example. This is quantum entanglement. There seems to be a kind of linkage between everything and everyone at a deeper level, instantaneous. Now, see? This is in a way showing the underpinning of this reality as non-material, non-physical. The material reality you see in front of your eyes, which separates one from the other, is, according to this philosophy that I belong to, mere appearance. And my biggest ally are 